Hi, everyone, and welcome to On the DL. I'm Dana Levinson. Uh, since October 7th, you may have noticed that the last several uh, episodes have been dedicated to the war in Israel. And while this may be a bit of a departure from our usual content on this show, we do dive into a lot of the hard stuff. So this, of course, came natural to me, and I appreciate you being here. Um, as a mother, as a Jewish woman, as a human being, I knew that I needed to speak with Rachel Goldberg. She is the mother of Hirsch Goldberg Poland. Hirsch was brutally and seriously wounded on October 7th at the Nova Music Festival. He was taken hostage and He's been in Gaza for the past 87 days. Rachel, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. How you doing? Shitty. I'm sure. And how is John? Shitty. <laughs> That's the number one question um, that we always say is the, actually the meanest question anyone can ask any ho hostage family is how are I'm you? Sorry. I'm so sorry so, I started that so way. That's a major, <laughs> that's a great way to start. Great way to break the ice. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because um, are you a mom? Yes, I'm a mom of five. Okay. So imagine one of them has been uh, brutally wounded without an arm and taken hostage for 87 days and you don't know anything about them. How are you? Exactly. And so that, that's how I am. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, I I have to tell you that um, every single morning, I wake up and I grab my phone. And the first thing that I do is I look to see if there's been any update on the hostages. And I think of Hirsch because I am a mom of four boys. And like so many other mothers and Jewish mothers that have been with you and following this horrific journey that you and your family are on. It resonates. It, it's, it, we all feel like that could be our child. So Hirsch is, Hirsch is our child now. Everybody has taken him as their own. That's how it feels to me and every other mother I've spoken to since this horrific day. Yeah, no, we feel that. We feel a lot of support. And um, I say that a lot. I say, I spoke today uh, to a group of 250 women. And I said, he's your son. And your mm -hmm. son's my son. Um, so, you know, exactly. go pray, go pray for your son. Exactly. And uh, we do, we, we, we pray for her every, every single day. Um, calls to the Jewish community to add Hirsch and the other hostages in their prayers while they dove in once, twice, or three times a day. Um, but above and beyond that, I think, I think I'd like to hear, I'd like to hear about Hirsch. I want to hear what, what kind of guy Hirsch is. Uh, Hirsch is um, a very curious, uh, kind, respectful, um, funny, with a very dry, dark sense of humor, sarcastic humor, but it doesn't go over to mean. It just, uh, it's, a, it's a good, smart humor without, without, there's no mean in Hirsch. It's just not who he is. He is a voracious reader. He loves soccer, wild about soccer, wild about music, wild about geography and travel. Um, he had this amazing first grade teacher who lit the fire of geography under that whole uh, classroom of kids. And uh, she was an Irish Catholic uh, teacher in an Orthodox day school. Um, and she was amazing. And um, so ever since first grade, he's had an obsession with maps and atlases and globes. And uh, he, in first grade, asked for a subscription to National Geographic. 
And so I got him the junior version because I thought, you you know, you are in first grade. And at the end of the year, when it was time to renew it, so funny because now nobody would ever have a subscription to a magazine, I feel like. But he feel came the with the card, the card that came in the magazine and he came and he said, here it says we have to renew, but this one's beneath me. I want the real National Geographic. So <laughs> at the end of first grade, he started to get the real, the real, not the junior um, uh, National Geographic. And um, he's just, he's adventurous. He's, he's confident, but he doesn't have a big ego, which is a nice combo. So he went this summer, he went for nine weeks to Europe by himself and went to six different music festivals in six different countries and met people from all over the world at these music festivals who write to us um, and send pictures to us and check in with us and are praying for him from all over the place. And uh, he liked having like long, hard conversations. He liked listening um, and he likes to, you know, even on the, on his nightstand next to his bed, he's halfway through the Dalai Lama's The Art of Happiness. His bookmark is right, right where he left it when he left on October 6th and it's waiting for him to get home so he can read the rest of The Art of Happiness. And he had a ticket to fly uh, December 27th. He was supposed to fly to India to start his mm -hmm. one to two year trip around the world that he's been planning since first grade in Mrs. Carlton's class. So we hope when he gets back, he will get, um, you know, the uh, treatment that he needs and the therapy that he will need. And that one day he will go on his trip around the world. And that's, willing, yes. that's a slice of Hirsch. That's just a slice. But, you know, when he gets back, Dana, then you'll, you'll interview him and then you'll get to I <laughs> cannot wait for that day. And Maybe. I pray every day that I will, I will, I'll come to Israel and oh, I'll come meet Hirsch. Or Hirsch. when he is on his travels around the world, he can come and sit at our Shabbos table here in Toronto. We would love that more than anything. Nice, nice. Uh, are you, are you okay to talk about what you know about October 7th? Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, I mean, it a little bit starts on the 6th because it was mm -hmm. Simchat Torah and we went as a family to shul and everybody danced with the Torah and everyone was very excited to see Hirsch because he had been away for so much of the summer, um, as I mentioned. And so, you know, people were coming over and talking to him. And then we went for Sh Shabbos dinner, you know, Simchat Torah dinner at Friends. And he had told us, Afterwards, I'm going, I'm bringing my bag and I'm going to go with Aner, who's one of his, you know, closest friends. And we're going to go do something fun somewhere. We didn't know what. We knew they were going to camp out somewhere. He brought his camping backpack, but I didn't know where he was going. He had just turned 23 three days before. So for his birthday, they were going to go do something fun. And around 11 o'clock, he kissed me. He kissed John. He said, I love you. I'll see you tomorrow. And that was 87 days ago. Um, and he, uh, he left and Saturday morning, October 7th, uh, John left for shul early by seven 30. Um, <clears throat> I was having a cup of tea and at just around eight o'clock, the bomb sirens started to go off in Jerusalem. So I ran to wake up my two daughters who are 20 and 18 and we got into the bomb shelter. And after 10 minutes, when there were no explosions, we came out because you that's the protocol. You wait 10 minutes. If you don't hear anything, you can come out. Normally, I don't use my phone on Shabbos, but because I knew the boys were camping out and there were bombs falling somewhere, I ran to the kitchen, opened the drawer and turned on my phone. And when I turned on my phone at 8.20, two WhatsApps popped up that had come in consecutively at 8.11 to the group that I have that is John, Hirsch, and me, just the three of us. And um, the first one said, I love you. And the second one said, I'm sorry. So I knew right away that something terrible was happening because I don't know why he would have written that, either of them, really, at that time, knowing, you know, he knew that I wouldn't normally be on my phone till after Shabbat. Um, and, um, you know, I was... I tried to call back. I wrote, are you okay? Tell me you're okay. I'm leaving my phone on. Tell me you're okay. 
And then my daughter, Libby, started to help me try to figure out where could the boys be. And she was looking online to try to see what was happening, you know, in the general vicinity of wherever that would have been something the boys would have gone to. And the Nova Music Festival popped up right away. And she said, I bet you they're there because Anair, his this best friend of his, was an amazing musician. And Hirsch had just mm-hmm. gotten back from nine weeks of going to music festivals that, you know, that he's wild about. And this was an international music festival. So um, I wrote to a third friend of theirs. It's They were like the three musketeers. I wrote to the third musketeer who was away for that Shabbos in Cyprus. He wasn't even mm-hmm. in Israel. And I said, are the boys here? And I sent a screenshot of the Nova Festival. And he said, they are, they're there. So we knew right away that they were there. And then, you know, all these videos are coming out of people getting shot and horrible, you know, massacre taking place there. So we were in a complete, you know, panic. And John came home like a few minutes later because they had closed all the shuls because of the bomb sirens. And I showed him my phone. I said, we're in trouble. And um, then we, everybody had their phones on. People who don't use their phones normally had their phones on because everybody wanted to know if everybody was okay. And um, that was already early afternoon on the 7th. We had maybe 15 or 20 people at our house trying to help us. Um, People were making calls to the different police stations, hospitals, kibbutzim, um, the army. I mean, everyone was just trying to call anybody to find out if anyone had any information. And then we start, you know, hearing more and more about what's happening on the kibbutzim that are on the border and... um, you know, initially, and time kept passing and passing, and we didn't hear from Hirsch. And by that night, the police contacted us and asked us to bring in samples of Hirsch's DNA. Um, So we found some hairs on his pillowcase, and we found an old toothbrush of his and had to go take that in. Um, And John had to give DNA samples of him, you know, him, his own. And then um, we had people, friends of ours who went, different people went to different hospitals in the South to look through the unidentified bodies because there were so many people who were killed. Well, first of all, just from the festival itself, there were 367 kids killed. And, you know, when you're running and you're at a music festival, hardly anyone had ID on them. So there were all these bodies. And um, we didn't think that we could handle going through them. We assumed our first assumption was, you know, before we got to what I'm about to say, you know, we said, oh, they're probably, they were running and they dropped their phones or their phone battery Mm -hmm. died. There's no coverage, you know, trying to come up with all sorts of the lies we tell ourselves so that we can take another breath. And then we started to realize he was probably dead not even probably like our assumption was that he was dead, which was obviously horrible. Um, and we didn't go to sleep at all that night. And we it was just sickening and a horrible night and friends stayed here with us. And then the next morning, um, we had to go to a different police. Uh, they set up a whole, uh, a, another central police uh, station so that people could come again and just make sure all the DNA was there for as they're trying to go through and identify bodies. And um, it was only then on Sunday, late in the day, that Libby came across a picture. My daughter came across a picture. Someone had sent on social media a picture from within a bomb shelter. And we saw that Hirsch was against the wall halfway in the room and on air, his friend was in the doorway. And at first we were so excited because we thought, oh my gosh, they weren't killed in the field at the music festival, but it didn't make sense. Why has it been 40 hours or, you know, 36 hours mm-hmm. and we haven't heard from them. So we kind of got very nervous about that. And what we ended up finding out is that when the massacre started to take place, Hirsch and on air and two other kids got in a car to try to escape. Hamas was lining the road and shooting point blank at every car that was coming toward them. So then there was this massive traffic jam because there were cars full of dead people and then new cars would arrive and they would just go and kill those people. 
So they did a U-turn and started to go south, even though to get home to Jerusalem, they would have been going north. So they went south and then there were rockets falling. So they got out of the car to go take cover in, they have roadside bomb shelters in the south. Mm -hmm. And they went into this bomb shelter and there were 29 kids mashed into this bomb shelter that was five feet by eight feet. So you can imagine, I mean, how tiny of a space it was. And Hamas came to the doorway and was throwing in hand grenades, which Aner was throwing out, which was really impressive. And they have footage of that from a dash cam um, of one of the cars that was wow. right on the side of the road. And Aner was able to throw out seven of the grenades and the eighth seven. grenade ex exploded in his hand and killed him. And then Hamas came in and shot an RPG into the room and then came and sprayed the room with machine gun fire. And most of those kids were dead right away. Um, a lot of them were very badly wounded and in the process of dying. There were a few lucky people who were on the bottom of these dead bodies and they're lucky because they could pretend to be dead. And they're the ones who told us what happened, which was after a few minutes of the dust settling, that um, Hamas came in with machine guns and there were three boys against the wall um, who were clearly wounded but were clearly alive. And they said to them, stand up and come out. And when Hirsch stood up, uh, the witnesses told us that his left arm from the elbow down had been blown off. Um, and he had somehow tied a bandage or a tourniquet of some sort around his arm. And they walked out and were put on a Hamas pickup truck and uh, which left in the direction of Gaza and Hirsch's last phone cell signal was detected at 1025 in the morning, October 7th, Saturday morning in Gaza. And, um, and then ironically, uh, a week later, we were being interviewed by Anderson Cooper on CNN and at the end of the interview, he said, I'm going to call you guys. And he mm -hmm. called and he said, I have footage of the abduction of your son. Um, he had been doing a documentary about the Nova Music Festival. And he had come across footage that was from a GoPro camera that had fallen off of the helmet of one of the Hamas people. And so that's how we ended up with the video that a lot of people have seen, where you see walking out of the um, bomb shelter at gunpoint, getting himself up onto the truck. He is left-handed like I am. And so the loss of his left arm, that was his dominant arm. He gets up and he, when he turns to sit down, you see the stump where his arm used to be. And you can see a jagged bone sort of sticking out from below the bandage that he had uh, made. And that's the last visual that we have of him. And um, we now live on a different planet than normal people. Yes. And I appreciate you telling me the entire story of October 7th. You you added some details I hadn't heard before. And I have to admit to you that I, I follow you every day. And every time mm -hmm. you speak or there is um, another video posting of you and John, um, I'm I'm glued to that because I want to hear more. I want more, more details, more of what, you know. Um, so I appreciate you telling me that, hearing that again. I saw the other day, someone referred to you as um, a warrior who is literally trying to part the sea to bring Hirsch home. Mm. And that's what it feels like. You haven't stopped for one moment you are this pillar of strength that i have I, I i don't even know how to describe it properly in words but i where do you find your strength now to continue to part the sea for hmm. him well i wish i wish that it was uh really true you know that i was Herculean, strong, and able to part mm -hmm. the sea. Um, I think both John and I feel this very primal, innate 
maternal and paternal. It's almost, it's an animalistic drive. It's very primal. It's very, it's not something that we think about. I think it's, uh, when you think about animals that think, you know, when you come across a bear when you're hiking and if you, God forbid, come across a bear that's with its baby, you know, you got to really make it clear that you're not there to hurt the baby because it's just built into our DNA that when you think that your child's in danger, real danger, um, you know, there's those stories of the mother who lifts the car to get her mm -hmm. baby out of the car seat that when the car's turned over. Um, we have this drive that we feel that we have to save his life. We have to save the lives of, you know, there's a 133 hostages still in Gaza. We do know that some of them are not alive, tragically, but we know that a lot of them, most of them are alive. And we just feel like we have to run to the end of the earth and turn over every single stone and fire in every different direction to try to to save our only son and to try to save you know all all the hostages that are there so it's um every day we wake up and similarly to what you said you know i first i i say this one line you know this line that a lot of people say traditionally when they wake up, Jewish people thanking God for giving back, um, for giving me back my soul. You have tremendous faith in me, meaning I'm saying to God, you have tremendous faith in me. You've given me back my life another day. You must have faith in me to do something with it. And I say, let today be the day. And then I take my phone because I, like you, want to see the headline to say, they're coming home. And um mm -hmm check the phone and then I say okay now it's time to pretend to be a person let's get let's get going and you know we have packed days we work back to back to back to back you know just doing lots of advocacy lots of media lots of meetings with um people who people supposedly who have power people who supposedly mm. you know um can get things done um we'll I, I i've seen this i i've i've read this i've watched this that you have met with you met with the pope mm -hmm. you've met with world leaders you speak to world leaders all the time and it's it it's um just when you feel that those, there's a shift there's no shift yeah uh it's um it's tricky work I will say that in the 50s, you know, when there were the pauses and there were mm -hmm. 100 hostages released, that was a huge, huge respite of hope mm -hmm. and joy. Um, mm, I bet. We knew, you know, it was good. They, they told us before anyone was released, they said, you know, Hirsch will not be released in this, in this um, chunk. So there was no expectation. So it was pure happiness it wasn't ever like oh is he going to be you know it wasn't like when you're in go and you're hoping that your next you know your next chip is going to be the chip that you win you win with so like we knew that and so it made it so that we were just happy to see families reunited and plus at that point you know at this point we're we know each other. So it was exciting to see, thank God he got his daughter back. Thank God his wife is home. Thank God his mother came back or, you know, whatever it was. So that was really great. And then the last, um, you know, 30 plus days have been much more difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, we just um, have to keep going. We have no choice. And so, it's always forward. And Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep walking. Because otherwise you're just stuck in hell. So every morning, mm -hmm. every going. day, every afternoon, keep going. And, uh, you know, we're tired and we're, um, 
weary, but we're tenacious and we're never giving up. Never, never giving yeah. up. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of our people, right? It's it's part of our life lessons. It's what mm -hmm. history has taught us. Um, it's not anywhere that we want to be, uh, but you are that living example. And I, I feel that, I feel that about you um, listening to you speak. Um, and I hope that others who listen to you speak and watch your um, drive and your love for your child uh, is so overpowering. Any of anything else that is happening and has happened since October 7th, that is what I'm, I hope continues to drive people and to think about those that are not home. Um, I feel very, very, very angry. Uh, it, it, it makes me very emotional and very angry when I, see that you know you've gone to geneva <laughs> to speak to the head of the red cross you know um that you and john literally are going to the end of the earth and what is it that we're not doing what is it as human beings what are we not doing like i feel that if there's anybody who could tell me tell us what do we need to do next i mean I think that it's very important that our world leaders know that we are not okay with this. I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, people who live in America, not North America, unfortunately, not, <laughs> I don't know how Torontonians can do this, but we have this great system going where we have hundreds of thousands of people calling the White House every day, which is making the White House insane. Oh, but beautiful. It's also oh, I love like, it. Oh. Right. I mean, it's really important that it not fall off the agenda. And we have people calling their local elected officials, you know, in Canada, you can do that. And it's, you know, the issue with the hostage crisis is that it's really a global humanitarian catastrophe. That's very different than however you feel about the Gaza Israel situation. And it is, it's a tricky hard topic and it's a complicated topic and it requires a lot of homework to really understand it. So I understand why people don't understand it. And I understand why people see these images coming out of Gaza. They're terrible images. Mm -hmm. It's horrible when innocent people are killed. It's horrible. And it doesn't matter whose babies they are. Innocent babies, when they're killed, it's a horrible thing. It doesn't matter what brand, what color, what texture, what religion, what language they speak. It's terrible. So I understand why that's traumatic for people. This isn't a competition of tears or of pain, but all of that is separate. It truly is separate from this hostage situation where you have people from over 20 different nations being held hostage right now. You have Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists being held hostage right now. You have the youngest hostage being 11 months old and the oldest one being 85. This is a very different situation than anything the world has ever seen. And it has to be treated as such. And leaders from all over the world should be told from the bottom up, from regular people, I'm not okay with this. I am not okay that 87 days in, there are children and elderly and barefoot, crunchy granola hippies being mm -hmm. held hostage in Gaza of all different stripes and flavors. I mean, what's really sad is that Hirsch has a friend who um, had gone to one of these music festivals this summer in Amsterdam. And he met a bunch of people from all over the world and he invited them to the Nova Music Festival. And five of them came, five of these non-Jewish, you know, music loving people from all over. And three of them were killed at the Nova Festival on the 7th and two of them are being held hostage. I mean, oh, it's, I... you know, and, and people don't understand the constellation of who is, who does that population, who is it comprised of? And I think people have to be more, um, more of an advocate for this global humanitarian issue 
of the hostages who are not being seen by anybody on earth for international uh, humanitarian aid. As we know, thank God the Red Cross is going in and seeing Gazan civilians as it should, because mm -hmm. they need the they need the aid. And I would say there are other civilians in Gaza who also need aid, who are not getting aid. Um, mm -hmm. For example, Hirsch, who is currently in Gaza and is a civilian and needs aid and is not getting aid. Um, and we know he had a horrible injury. Um, and we know many other people were wounded uh, and had horrible injuries before they were kidnapped. Uh, many of the elderly were wounded before they were kidnapped. Um, and so I think when you're saying, you know, what can we do? The number one thing is you can talk to your local elected officials who, by the way, you pay their paycheck. They mm -hmm. owe you to listen to you. So if you're not okay with this, you can call and tell them. And you don't have to have a whole hour long conversation. It could be 30 seconds. I'm just calling to tell you that it's day 87 and there's still 133 hostages in Gaza from all over the world. And I'm not okay with it. That's I want it. to start this campaign. It's, I want to right. start this campaign in Canada because we could do that. So what you could do is you could look at, we created a website that uh, bring, bring them home, created a website called One Min A Day. Mm -hmm. And you can go look at it when we get off because it allows you to put in your zip code and then it shows you exactly who are your local elected officials? Here is their phone number. Here is how to text them if you prefer or, or uh, email them. And here's even um, a text to say, if you're not comfortable with you know, saying your own thing, here's some talking points if you want them. Um, and, they, and they will make that website for you. They made it the bring them home if you are in you know you just have to call and explain you know how the system works in canada and you can make that happen um so that's something I've, very i easy. have been in touch with them i have Great. actually okay. yesterday they reached up to me so um i'm actually having a call with them later so this is this Perfect. will coincide with our conversation um thank goodness so i feel that okay going right. forward this is what I can help to do from here right. in Canada. Uh, it is a much different situation than in the United States, um, as you know, but it is something and it is something right. that no, we can something. do. It is and something. sharing people's stories and sharing these stories. You know, it's 133, even if you say 100, even if you say 50, that becomes a number. But if you tell someone's story, then it is actually a human being. And I think what has been so helpful about telling Hirsch's story is that he looks like everybody's somebody. He looks like either the guy who babysat your kids or the counselor from camp or the your your nephew, or, you know, he has like a very, you know, kind of uh, every boy kind of look. Um, you know, I've been, John and I have been able to speak to the foreign press uh, a lot because we happen to speak English well. So his story has been out there. And I will say, going back to when you said, you know, where do you get strength from? We definitely get strength. We get hundreds of thousands of emails and WhatsApps and, and words of encouragement and on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all sorts of places. And it actually helps, you know, knowing that we also have people from all different religions, all different backgrounds who are reaching out and saying, you know, here, look, we people sent us pictures of their Christmas dinner table mm -hmm. with the whole family there and one plate and it said Hirsch. You know, mm -hmm. that that gives strength to breathe in a world without air. And, you know, and when Obviously, our Jewish brothers and sisters all over the world are sending us, you know, their prayers and saying to heal him for him and incorporating all of the hostages into everyday life to say, we're not going to get comfortable with this. And I, you know, we got scared today. Like, I pray to God that this is not the case. But suddenly today, the team, you know, we have a strategic team and we have all these meetings and we're always thinking ahead and someone said what are we going to do if he's not back by day 100 and it's like my stomach dropped 
And I was like, don't even say that. And they said, Rachel, you're on day 87. Like there's a chance, like we have to plan that, you know? And just like the thought of that is so nauseating. And I thought, and I'm, you're gonna be the first person I'm gonna tell. I said, I'm gonna tell everyone to start wearing the masking tape with a number on it if we get to day 100. That I'm not doing this alone, Dana, you're doing this for your son too until these people come home because it's so unacceptable and it makes people very uncomfortable. People like a countdown. People, people do not like a count up. Yes. <laughs> and a count up is unacceptable. And especially this high, it's enough. It's enough. Yeah. It isn't, it's enough. You know, I, I saw your conversation with uh, scooter Ron last week and mm -hmm screamed to me because as I mentioned to you, I've been following you every day. And when he turned and looked at the camera and said, you know, everyone in my fellow music industry, do something, say something, you're not saying anything. And then he said to current reporters, past reporters, people in the news, people who have platforms, do something. And it like, it hit me in the gut, really hit me in the gut. Um, and I thought to myself, I have to get over myself and I have to reach out to you because every time I tried to reach out to you, I stopped because I couldn't get through my own Michigas. I was too, I, I couldn't get through it. I, I said, I can't, I can't do that. I, it's just not, it's just not an interview I can do. I can't do this. But then I thought I, ha I have to, this is something I have to do. And I was so grateful that he had said those words and that it had hit me so hard um, and that I did reach out to you. And I'm hoping that other people that are watching or listening don't necessarily have to reach out to you, but they have to do something because it is unacceptable. It is, it, it's that word is just too kind. Unacceptable is just, it's a kind word almost when you're thinking of this, of this situation, it's too surreal to use such, such a, almost a benign word at this point. I want to ask you, um, you talked about a little bit of a, a respite around day 50, day 52. So interesting how we <laughs> describe our life in days now, you know, day two, day three, day 52. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was joy. There was so much joy when we saw the children coming home and so many of the women coming home. Did you have an opportunity <laughs> to speak with any of family to, did you feel, did, did you get any information about Hirsch at that point? No. So first of all, we wrote to the families who we knew who got their people back, of course. Now you realize the whole family, including the person who came back, everyone's suffering terrible trauma. So nobody's yes. nobody's going to bother them yeah. um but they were you know obviously the authorities were very careful to check in with everyone to see who have you seen do you recognize this person what they've kind of understood is everyone who was taken was generally held with people they were taken with so most of those women and children were taken from kibbutzim and they were held with people from the kibbutzim the kids who were taken from the festival, there have only been three people uh, um, returned who were at the festival. Uh, one of them was a security guard who was dragged away from the actual field. Um, and two were siblings who were in a car, as I had mentioned, like that they were getting shot at. And she was she was wounded. Um, she mm -hmm. was shot several times in the leg and they were dragged from their car. So none of those people had been taken from a bomb shelter. Hirsch was taken in a truck with four, three other, it was three boys from his bomb shelter. There was already someone in the truck who presumably was from the bomb shelter next door. There were a bunch of them in a row. So it what it's not unusual that the people who were released didn't see uh, the people who uh, you know, we're from the music festival. So we don't have from, from people who, who came back, we don't have anyone that we, you know, 
know of that anyone knows of that had seen him. But um, but we were told that that actually really makes sense. They hadn't seen anybody, like any of those 40 plus kids who were taken from the music festival, no one had seen any of them. So presumably they're being held in a different place than the women and children from the Kibbutzim War. There has been so much um, outcry that there are still women there, that part of the deal at that day, 49, day 50, that all the women were going to come home and that a, a chunk of the women that are still there, there were from the festival as well. Um, and the whole world is just, you know, screaming, where are the women, where are the women? And nobody wants to go there. Like, why are they not released? What is happening? What's happened to them? And, and that's very important. And I think the outcry needs to continue. But I read something um, the other day, again, also resonates as a mother of boys, um, about what about our boys? We haven't been screaming enough about our boys. And I want to read this to you because there's no, I don't, I don't think that you probably didn't <laughs> read this. I assume you're not scrolling through social media and look, no, I, I assume that. So I'm going to, is that okay if I read this to you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this comes and it said, to the dozen of male hostages, you got a raw deal. We are so desperate to humanize Israelis in a world that has forsaken Jews. We mostly speak of the women, children, and elders. We appeal to what's left of humanity. This could be your baby, your mother. You are no more deserving of being in Gaza. You could have just as easily been my father, my brother, my husband. The only thing you are guilty of is being born a man in Israel. The world has forsaken you, but I think about you every day. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually was bringing up recently that the least valued people on earth, and it's ironic because who are the people who are running everything? Who are the people in all of the rooms making those decisions? Who are the leaders of all of the vast majority of places in the world are men. And it is very interesting that actually we least value men. There's something very interesting about it. Um, Someone said to me, oh, you know, in that first um, group of people who were released, someone did say, but he's your baby. Like when they were saying they were releasing women, children, and babies, they said, okay, but he's your baby. Um, look, um, I think it's complicated. And um I think we live in a very imperfect world with a lot of opportunity for improvement. Um, and I think that we don't value life very much, a lot of us. And uh, a lot of us claim to value life, but then, um, you know, as our mothers told us, actions speak louder than words. And I do feel very strongly at this point that, um, you know, in the book of Vayikra, in the book of Leviticus, it says, Lo tamod al dam reecha ani Hashem. You know, do not stand idly by as your brother's blood is flowing, which the, you know, the commentators explain. If you can help someone who's dying, who's in a violent situation, you must, it's not try, it's not see what you can do. It's you must help. And then it says, Ki ani Hashem, which, you know, I am God. And the commentators say, why? Why does it say that? Like, that's weird. It's a non sequitur. And the commentators explain, because there's no, um, there is no forgiveness for it if you don't do this. Um, mm -hmm. You can't make amends and one day you will face God and you will be punished for allowing it to happen. Um, there's no atonement. And so I think we as the world and you know the major religions in the world, Judeo-Christian, Islam, all, val all have that as part of our heritage, all of us, all three. Um, we are not allowed to do what is do what is happening right now. Um, and we will all be judged for it if we don't handle it soon. Because the longer that these people stay there, as we know, we're watching it, they're dying. It's 
not like the Iran hostage situation where these hostages were held in a nice clean office building and food mm -hmm. was delivered to them every day. This is, you know, a horrible situation and people are dying every day and it will be on us. Mm -hmm. and, and you also were talking about how it is a nightmare for Jewish people to look back at their life and mm -hmm. have regret of their the way they behaved. Yeah, yeah, missed opportunities. And this is an opportunity, not just for Jewish people around the world, for human beings around the world to do what's right. Right. To do what's to do right. right and what's even more wonderful is to do the right thing for people from all over the world. Yes. You know, there yes. are, I keep saying, I mean, I feel for it, there are Arab Muslims being held hostage right now. And we're all sitting by. There are Jewish Americans being held hostage. There are Israeli Jews being hostage. There are, there's uh, someone from Mexico. There are people from uh, the UK, you know, Brits being held hostage. I mean, you can pick who you want to feel al aligned with or feel familiar to. There are Christians being held hostage. There's someone from Nepal who's a Buddhist, you know, whatever it is, it's not okay. You know, it's not okay. People know it's not okay. And I don't actually think that it's such an active, um, aggressive passivity. I think it's just indifference. And I think we like to think of ourselves as human beings, as caring, but I'm not convinced that we are uh, using our full capacity of caring um, in a lot of ways. I mean, I think we fall short in a lot of ways, but on the other hand, then that's opportunity. There's opportunity here. There's opportunity in the world to take a chance and to do the right thing, even when it's scary. And um, I know, again, I don't know if this seems like a mean question, but I haven't heard anybody talk about your girls. You, this was the first time I've heard how old they are. I didn't know how old your, your daughters are. are. Um, I, I'm sending them love to you because I imagine this is so brutal, so brutal for them. Um, I saw a little, I, I think it may have been one of them when you were at the airport the other day. Mm -hmm. Was she reading something? That was one of your yeah. daughters? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I could tell that uh, this young woman, it seemed like she had to muster up a lot of courage to stand and speak that way. And I, I thought this, this, this must be Hirsch's sister. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt it. I could tell that um, they are just probably bottomed out from this. Um, yeah, beyond, beyond. Yeah. You know, it's a problem and... that's that's continuous. That's the problem. It's not like trauma. Regular trauma is the car hit somebody on a bicycle, and that person, you know has to figure out how am I going to continue my life now that, you know, I don't I have use of my legs or whatever, you know, there's mm -hmm. everybody, there's trauma. People every single day, millions of people all over the earth have trauma that happens and we have to figure out how do you roll over? At what point do you roll over? At what point do you start to sit? At what point do you start to stand? At what point do you start to walk? At what point do you start to heal? And it's different for everyone. The problem with the hostage families is we are in the trauma. We're still in the trauma. The car, it's slow motion. The car is in the middle of hitting us. So we can't, there's no, we're frozen. We're frozen, locked into a trauma. So we can't start to go forward. We just are trying to get the trauma to stop. And that's tricky. And most people on earth, thank God, have never experienced it. And that's where you talk that you're living in a different universe right now. Mm -hmm. That's how it feels. You've been on a different planet since this happened. Right. And you strike me as a woman who would never speak ill of anyone. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't heard you say anything negative about anyone. And I know that you have reached out to 
as you said, some very important leaders, um, artists that you have asked to please, please get involved. And there hasn't really been much movement on that end either. I'll tell you what's even funnier. I didn't even ask them to be involved. I mm. said, can I have a private conversation with you so you could give me strength as I look up to you? I won't take oh. a picture. I won't do a Zoom. I'll talk to you on the telephone so that there's okay. no proof of it, right? Like I won't secretly take a screenshot and then out you as if I would do that. Um, I just want to have a phone call or I'll come to you wherever you are if you're nervous and I'll just, I'll come to your house and I'll like sneak in the back or we can meet at <laughs> your friend's house or your mom's house or your kid's house. And I just want to have a conversation with you. I didn't want anyone to get involved but they wouldn't talk to me. That's Any of them? Saying. No. Wow. No. Because they're so scared that, you know, I spoke to the agent of one of them and he said, you know, just things always get out. I said, you have no idea who I've, who I've <laughs> spoken to because I haven't told, I've spoken to some really like woohoo people and I'm sure about it because I have not, I, I was doing it for my own purpose of also, I wanted to get, there was one person whose worldview I really wanted. I really admire his worldview for many years. And so I wanted him to, and he's not from my background in any way. And I thought it would be helpful for me to understand if I could get his perspective and Apparently, I'm just terrifying because he wouldn't have a conversation with me, a private conversation with me. I wasn't saying to post anything. I wasn't saying to wear a pin. Um, but that's, you know, just to clarify, it wasn't, you know, an ask of like, why don't you get involved? Mm -hmm. Okay. It no, I'm glad you simply, clarified that, that I didn't simply, know that. Yeah, that's why I'm telling you. It was because yeah. that already I could even though I think like that's really not brave and it's not very decent to not get involved when you know something is wrong is happening. I think that's pretty um, unimpressive, but I think it's really, really, I don't even know what the word is to describe when the mother of someone who's been stolen for, you know, I think at that point it was 70 something days without his arm, his crime being that he likes music. Um, and the person saying, I won't talk to you. I think it's indecent. I think it's inhumane right? it's and gross. I think it's, it's really it's like gross. Perverse. It's really it's gross. gross. It's, it's gross. Perverse. And and I, th I mean, a lot of people would you know scream it's anti-Semitic, but I, I, that's a whole other conversation. Um, that's a whole other fight right now um that's not what this is about this is about Hirsch and and what's happening with Hirsch and it's I'm sure you know you've heard all of it but that's not your that's not your fight right now your fight yeah. is you just wanted to speak to somebody and get perspective and that's um that's very very disheartening to hear and I'm so sorry that you um that you had that response it's really disgusting really disgusting you know uh, I I've said this since day one um I've lost some friends over this. I've had um, some arguments. Um, I've wiped my hands clean of some people that I've uh, worked with for over 20 years. Um, the truth always comes out. The truth always comes out. And um, people will either be on the right side of the truth or they won't with this. Right. And that's the bottom line. And that's how... You know, we have to think of this. Um, I do think you are the bravest person I've ever spoken to in my career and in my life. Mm. And I'm very grateful that you took this time to speak with me. Um, I feel a little changed. I feel like I have a, I have a job to do, I have a purpose. Um, mm. I do, um, and I'm hoping to spread that widely in Canada. Because uh, they're, even though our community is small, it is, it is hardy. Definitely, very, definitely. Very hardy. Yeah. And um, Hirsch's name comes up all the time. And 
I, I can speak on behalf of the mothers that I've spoken to. They feel very connected to you. Um, and as you said, they're all our children there. They're all our children. And we pray for every single one of them. And Hirsch, for sure, he's in my prayers every single day. Thank you. Well, don't stop and keep doing what you're doing. It's important work. And uh, hopefully, God willing, you'll get to meet him when he gets back. I can't wait. Thank you, Rachel. I'm sending my love to you and your family, to John and your girls and your extended family and everybody in Israel. Um, Thank you. Keep fighting and we will keep praying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for listening.